Try to inhabit your whole body. Think of where your feet are, your hands are, your legs, your arms, your torso, your head. How do you sense these things? It's through the breath energy and the, and the nerves. It goes through the blood vessels, it goes through your muscles. All of this comes under the category of breath. And it's related to the in and out breath. So look at the in and out breath too. How does it feel? What kind of breathing would feel really good right now? What would energize your torso? What would nourish the muscles around the heart? In what way is the energy flowing through the body? And John Lee talks about the down-flowing energy and the up-flowing energy. The terms actually come from the canon. And his interpretation is that when you breathe in, sometimes there's a sense of the energy going down from the head down to the feet, and other times it comes from the feet up the spine into the head. What kind of breathing do you need right now? If you're feeling wired, you want to think of the energy going down. If your energy level is down, think of it coming back up. Make sure it doesn't get stuck in the head. If you find that there's pressure building up in the head, check to see if the muscles in the back of the neck are relaxed. And also look at the muscles around your throat in the front, down into the heart. Think of everything being wide open and maintain that perception. This sort of exploration is something you have to do on your own, because we all sense our breath energy in different ways, and it gets out of balance in different ways. But what you want to do is reclaim it for several reasons. One, it helps get you into the body, develop that whole body awareness where there's a sense of ease that you can knead through the body the same way that you would knead moisture through a, a ball of dough. That helps get you into concentration. Then it sensitizes you to things going on in the mind that you might miss otherwise. Some people think of concentration as being a blocking out, and there are certain things that you are blocking out right now, but you do become very sensitive to the energy in the body. And that's directly related to things coming up in the mind. And it's your first line of defense when a strong emotion suddenly appears. First, if you're really sensitive to what's going on in the body, you can detect the emotion before it's strong. That helps you to deal with it right there. But the breath energy is part of what's called bodily fabrication. And it's one of the three kinds of fabrication that go into creating an emotion. Here in the West in particular, we have this belief that our emotions are what we really are, what you really feel. But a lot of those real feelings are simply habit. A certain incident comes up and immediately you breathe in a certain way and you perceive it in a certain way and you frame the issue in a certain way and you're, you're stuck. As long as you can't back off from these things and refabricate it. And the breath is one of the best ways of giving you a separate place to stay. As soon as there's that tightness in the breath, think of it relaxing. It's good to go around and have a sense of where, when things tense up in the body, around fear or anger, jealousy, whatever. Where are the centers of the tension? Because what usually happens is there'll be a spot that tenses up and first, and then a the tension spreads from there throughout different parts of the nervous system. If you can watch over that part, make that spot your default place to stay, you can catch things quickly and diffuse them quickly. Breathe through the tension. Breathe through the tightness. Keep those areas open. And that takes a lot of the power away, because many times uh, an emotion comes up. And we have this feeling we've got to get it out of our system. Well, the, the, the problem that's in the system is the tension that builds up 
in the water property and in the other properties of the body through the problem in the breath. If you can diffuse the breath, then you're basically taking what was hijacked and reclaim it. And then you're in a position to look at the other aspects that go into fabricating that emotion. There's what's called verbal fabrication, your direct thought and evaluation. In other words, what topics you focus on and what you tell yourself about those topics. Someone does something and it triggers all your anger. Anger triggers. Well, what are those triggers? A sense of oppression, a sense of being wronged. I mean, what are the issues that you tend to carry around this way? A lot of us go around, as John Lee says, with exposed wires. And the current is running. It's just ready to, as soon as anything comes up, you run into anybody else's exposed wires, it's going to be a short. So you've got to know what your exposed wires are. What are the issues that tend to get to you? And before they get to you, sit down and talk to yourself about them. Why should you perceive that particular incident in that frame? Are there other ways of framing it? If you see someone as an oppressor, can you think of that person as being oppressed? Or can you think of yourself as standing outside the line of that person's anger or abuse or whatever? When, they, when the person says something really nasty, can you see the words just going right past you? Or do you have an automatic built-in vacuum cleaner that just picks up all the dirt in the atmosphere? Well, learn how to filter that. Turn the vacuum cleaner off. Let the word just go right past. And part of you might say, well, they're insulting me. Well, get out of the way. If insult comes your direction, you don't have to take it. There was that famous passage where there was a Brahmin that came to insult the Buddha. And the Buddha asked him, when you have guests and you offer them food and they don't accept the food, whose food is it? And the Brahmin says, well, it's mine. He said, well, the Buddha said, well, in the same way, if you offer that insult to me, I don't accept it, so it's, it's yours. You can have it. In other words, learn to look at yourself as not being under that person's power just because they've said that thing. You don't have to get back at the person. And it certainly doesn't reflect badly on you that that person has said that thing. If you believe that other people will have to believe that other person, you can't go around and straighten out everybody else's opinion on things. If they want to believe it, that's their business. You learn something that way. To so learn how to look at the situation in a different way. That's the verbal fabrication part. Then the mental fabrication is your perceptions and feelings. If you're dealing with the breath in a skillful way, you've got the feelings on your side right there. And as for the perceptions, they're very similar to the directed thought and evaluation. Think of directed thought and evaluation as the full sentences that go through your mind, whereas the perceptions just as words or images. What kind of image do you have? Are you the judge sitting way up on a seat? where you can pass judgment on people down below you? Or do you want to take the image the Buddha gives of a person going through the desert hot, tired, trembling with thirst, come across a little bit of water in a cow footprint? Now you know if you try to scoop it up, you'll muddy the water. You need the water, so you get down on all fours and you slurp it up. At that point, of course, you don't want anyone to come along and take a picture of you. But even though the pose may be undignified, that's what you got to do. In the same way, even though you may feel that it's beneath you to try to look for the good in the other person, you need that person's goodness. Otherwise, if you go around in the world seeing nothing but the bad things that other people do, you get inclined to follow that example. But if you realize, okay, this person it does have some goodness, it makes it easier to 
have some goodwill for that person and not get angry. Now, if that's too much, you have to remind yourself that you're harming yourself with the anger. This is where the Buddha's instructions on thinking about what happens to people when they're angry. What do they do? They look ugly when they're angry. They many times destroy things that are dear to them. They ruin their reputation one way or another. They ruin their wealth one way or another. All of this would be satisfying or gratifying to an enemy to see that. If all you can see that other person is your enemy, this is what you think about. The person wants to do me in, but I'm not going to let me do myself in. I'm not going to give that person the satisfaction of seeing me do myself in. If that's what you need to think, okay, that's what you got to think. Anything to get rid of the anger. The Buddha was once asked, what, is the ki what kind of killing does the Buddha condone? Some people would have you believe that he condoned state killing or whatever, but he didn't. The one thing he condoned the killing of was anger. And so think in whatever ways, develop perceptions of whatever kind help to get you past that. And it's good to think about these things beforehand, so you don't have to get suddenly creative when anger is staring you right in the face. You've thought the matter through. Because we all know where our buttons are, we know where our issues are. So sit down and think about them. What can you do not to get pulled into those issues again? That's a useful meditation. Meditation is not just being in the present moment. Right effort is not just a matter of being in the present moment. There's the right effort of trying to prevent unskillful states from arising. That means you sit down, especially if you know you're going to go into a situation where t people are ready to push your buttons. You've got to deactivate the buttons. Sit down and plan. If this person says X, what are you going to do? The fact that people say unpleasant things should not surprise you. This is another th way the Buddha has you think, is to depersonalize the whole thing. One is realizing that the kind of speech that human beings engage in sometimes is well-meaning and sometimes it's not well-meaning. Sometimes it's true and sometimes it's false. Sometimes it's gentle, sometimes it's harsh, sometimes it's outrageous. When someone says something outrageous to you, that's not the first time that's happened in the world. You're not the only person who's being subjected to that. Everybody, even the Buddha, was subjected to criticism. Totally unfair. I just chalk that up to the fact that you were born as a human being, and this is the kind of stuff that human beings are subject to. This is not to become totally passive, but at least it gets you emotionally out of the issue. And then you can look at it, the issue, from a more objective standard. What would be an effective thing to say right now? The other way of depersonalizing it, the Buddha recommends, is to say, okay, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear. How many times have you thought that when someone's been saying something really nasty to you? Just leave it right at the ear and don't take it into your mind. Don't take it into your heart. That's just it, an unpleasant sound. Can you leave it there and not suck it in, not elaborate stories around it? These are important skills. Learning how to recognize how you fabricate an emotion and how you do it unskillfully, and how you can deconstruct it and construct something more skillful in its place. It may sound artificial, but the whole process of constructing an emotion is artificial. It's something fabricated. There's an element of intention. And in many cases, the intentions have become so habitual that they seem automatic. And because of the strength of the perceptions and the strengths, the strength of the breath, or that particular way of breathing around greed or aversion or delusion, you tend to think, well, this is what I really feel. But it's just a habit. And as with any habit, if you see that it's harmful to you, harmful to the people around you, 
You want to learn how to undo it, replace it with other habits. So the breath is your first line of defense. This is why it's so important to get sensitive to how you manipulate the breath energy. And as I was saying the other day, it's like you have a series of tools. The breath is a tool that you can use to counteract a negative emotion. The ways you think can be used to counteract the negative emotion. The perceptions you hold in mind can be changed to counteract that emotion. And you do that because you're using the tools in the light of day. If you leave them underground, you deal with them underground, use them underground where it's dark, imagine all the harm you can do if you just took your saw and started sawing in the dark, or took your hammer and started banging away in the dark. That's the way most of us deal with our breath energy, deal with our perceptions and our thoughts. And the whole purpose of the meditation is to allow us to use these tools in the light of day. So we can develop a path, a path that takes us to something better, a better way of living, a better way of acting, speaking, thinking. This is something we can all manage. For some people it comes more quickly, for others it comes more slowly, but that's not the issue. You can get better at how you act and speak and think. That's what the meditation is for.